We all know Windows Firewall as the staple of modern PC security, but if we rewind the clock to mid-1990s, Windows NT4, it simply didn't exist. But that doesn't mean admins were defenseless. Buried deep within the advanced TCP properties was a primitive manual and often forgotten precursor to the firewalls we use today. In this video, we're examining TCP IP security, the hidden tool that kept the enterprise safe before XP Service Pack 2 changed the game forever. When people think about Windows and firewalls, this is usually where the story begins. Windows XP was the first time Microsoft treated a personal firewall as a serious built-in feature of the operating system. Although early versions of XP included a firewall, it was Service Pack 2 that truly changed things, switching it on by default and making it a visible central part of Windows security. The design was intentionally simple for everyday users, but underneath it was a capable system that allowed detailed access controls over application and networks, making it suitable for both home and business environments. But it raises an interesting question. If Windows XP had a firewall, what about the versions of Windows that came before it? Did Windows NT have a firewall of its own? And if it did, how are you actually supposed to use it? In Windows NT, there was no firewall in the modern sense. Instead, security was tucked away deep inside the TCP IP configuration under an option simply labeled security. From here, NT offered a very blunt set of controls. You could choose to allow or block entire classes of traffic, TCP, UDP, or ICMP, or you could switch the model entirely and specify that only certain traffic was allowed. What you couldn't do was selectively block individual ports while leaving everything else open. Crude by modern standards, but deliberate and very much in keeping with how Windows NT expected networks to behave. To demonstrate how this works in practice, we need something simple and predictable running on the workstation. For that, a web server is ideal. On Windows NT Workstation, the most practical choice was Personal Web Server, which shipped as part of the Windows NT Option Pack. It wasn't designed for production use, but it was perfectly suited to small tests like this, opening a known port and giving us something concrete to observe in the network. With that in place, we can now watch exactly what happens when traffic is allowed and when it isn't. The option pack itself is an interesting snapshot of the period. Alongside personal web server, it included front page 98 extensions, a reminder of a time when building websites was tightly bound to the operating system. It also marked the first appearance of the Microsoft Management Console. This was Microsoft beginning to move away from scattered control panels toward a single extendable way of managing services and infrastructure. It's easy to overlook now, but this is sort of quietly introduced tools and ideas that would shape Windows administration for years to come personal web server running the setup itself is refreshingly simple, a straightforward directory structure, an index file and a couple of GIFs dropped into place. Nothing dynamic, nothing clever, just static HTML, exactly as it would have been at the time. The result is a familiar site, an under construction banner, a spinning visitor counter and a page that exists solely to prove the server is online. It's deliberately basic, but that's the point. From a Windows XP machine, I then attempt to browse to the web page hosted on the NT workstation. The page doesn't load because I'm using the workstation's NetBIOS name, and without Wins, that name can't be resolved, which is immediately apparent when a ping to it fails as well. To resolve this, I edit the host file directly, which is found at C WinNT System32 Drivers ETC. Because the file has no extension, it only appears once Notepad is set to show all files. By adding a static entry that maps the workstation's IP address to its NetBIOS name, name resolution immediately starts working, and the ping to the NT workstation now succeeds. With name resolution, XP can now see the NT web page. With everything working, we can now start tightening things down. In the TCP IP security settings, I switch the filtering model to permit only and then leave the TCP list completely empty. That tells Windows NT to accept no inbound TCP connections at all. Nothing is blocked selectively. Instead, everything is denied by default. On screen, we can see Wireshark running on the Windows NT workstation, capturing traffic in real time while I, on the monitor, attempt to access the website from the Windows XP machine. As the page is requested, we're watching the packet capture as Windows XP sends the network request across the network to the NT workstation. I stop the capture and apply a simple filter, limiting the view to traffic destined for port 80 on the NT workstation. Wireshark immediately highlights the failed connection attempts in red. If we expand one of these packets, we can see a TCP reset being sent back. A reset packet is the network stack's way of saying there's nothing listening here. The connection isn't being ignored or silently dropped it's being actively refused. In other words, the request reaches the workstation, but the TCP IP security filter prevents it from ever reaching the web server. At this point, the next question becomes more interesting. If we can selectively block and allow traffic, what does an NT workstation actually need in order to communicate with a domain controller? To explore that, I set up a Windows NT server and promote it to primary domain controller. With the domain in place, the workstation is then joined to it off camera, ready for the next set of tests. Server Manager 
on the Windows NT server confirms that the workstation is now successfully joined to the domain. With the workstation now part of the domain, I return to the TCP IP security settings. This time I configure the system to block all TCP and UDP traffic. No exceptions, no open ports, everything denied by default. With that in place, we can see exactly what happens when an NT workstation is locked down as tightly as possible. After restarting the workstation, I attempt to log on using a domain account. There's a noticeable pause after the password is entered before Windows reports that the domain controller cannot be contacted. This tells us something important. Even though the workstation is already a member of the domain, it still needs certain network ports open in order to authenticate. Looking in the event log on the workstation, we can see the corresponding error recorded here as well, confirming that the domain controller could not be contacted during the login attempt. As a next step, I re-enable all inbound UDP traffic on the workstation and restart it to see how that affects domain logon. After restarting the workstation, I log on again, and this time there's no warning about the domain controller. The event log confirms a successful connection to the domain, which tells us something very clear. The ports required for NT domain authentication, at least at this stage, are UDP ones. The two ports I am now adding here, UDP 137 and 138, are the NetBIOS ports that Windows NT relies on during domain logon. Port 137 is used to resolve names, allowing the workstation to locate the domain controller, while port 138 carries the NetBIOS datagrams used during the authentication exchange itself. We have to open these ports inbound because UDP is connectionless and the reply from the server is therefore treated as a new inbound connection rather than part of an existing session. With those two ports enabled, I log on once again and this time the process completes without delay. The event log shows no errors, confirming that the workstation has successfully authenticated with the domain. Next, I enable a shared folder on the NT workstation and then move over to the server to test whether that share can be accessed from the domain controller. From the server, I open Network Neighborhood and browse to the NT workstation. The machine is visible, but when I try to open it, the shared folder can't be accessed. To allow that access, I now add TCP port 139, which is used for NetBIOS sessions carrying file sharing and remote administration traffic on Windows NT. Once TCP 139 is allowed inbound, the server is able to browse the workstation shared folder without issue. From the NT server, server manager can now connect to the workstation, allowing remote administration tasks such as viewing its shared resources and seeing how many files are currently in use. What this shows is that Windows NT did have a way to control network access, just not the way we'd recognize it today. By selectively allowing the traffic it actually needed, the workstation was still able to authenticate, communicate with the domain and expose services when required. It's a simple model, but one that makes a lot more sense once you understand the assumptions NT was built around. Windows NT did have TCP IP filtering, but it was never designed to be centrally managed or deployed at scale, which is why it remains largely an unused and poorly understood feature. Looking back, it's clear that TCP IP security in Windows NT was a blunt instrument. It lacked the stateful inspection and intelligence that we now expect from a firewall, acting more like a heavy iron gate, either open or closed. But within the assumptions of the networks it was built for, it made sense. And understanding that helps explain not just how Windows NT worked, but why most modern host-based firewalls evolved the way they did. Hope you enjoyed the video. A little bit of a dive into some of the intricacies of Windows NT 4 that you might not have seen before. If you like what I'm doing on the channel, please subscribe, give me a like. It really boosts me and helps me make more content. And I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-da!